So thank you very much for coming this evening to um, our talk on the power of primary care in prostate cancer. My name is Dr Anita Munoz. I'm a GP uh, in Melbourne CBD and I'm also a clinical editor on the Health Pathways program. Uh, and we're here to discuss um, prostate cancer screening management and a bit about survivorship care in general practice this evening. Um, so thank you very much for making the time to attend. Uh, I will be joined a little bit later on by Dr. Homi Zagar, who is a urologist um, here at the APCR, and also Dave Gray, who is a nurse practitioner. So first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I would also like to um, draw your attention to the fact that we're talking about prostate cancer um, in the context of a second wave of optimal care pathways that are being developed for improving the management of cancer in the community and the prostate cancer optimal care pathways have been developed uh, alongside esophagogastric care pathways. Uh, so we're making that um, information available to you and if you're not familiar with the optimal care pathways, I'd encourage you to have a look. Uh, there's some very useful content in them. Just so that you can look for these pathways uh, in your own practices and familiarise yourself with them if you haven't seen them before, this is what an optimal care pathway looks like. Um, and there are three components to each. Um, I, I think the short desktop guides are really helpful to have on hand when you're seeing patients in your practice um, and you know we will be supplying with some links so that you can have a little read about those. A lot of the content that um, we will refer to in the discussion today draws from the optimal care of prostate cancer which is cited in those documents. So without further ado, we can get to the topic at hand, which is prostate health in general practice. And I think at the moment, it's fair to say that prostate cancer care is still somewhat contentious, but is becoming more exciting from the point of view of primary care, because we are now starting to see more of an alignment in the guidelines for general practitioners about how to approach this condition, where previously there's been more confusion and difficulty in interpreting different guidelines and different consensus statements from different uh, peak bodies. For the first time ever really in, um, in the production of uh, guidelines, multiple colleges have come together with multiple um, specialists in, a, in an advisory committee capacity to give us a final consensus statement and I think that's quite a special thing. So what we're going to try and answer today is prostate cancer screening. Who do we actually screen? When do we do it and how often is screening required? And clear up some of the confusion about the use of the word screening which is often causes some anxiety about whether or not we're doing more harm than good. In medicine, I often find it amusing that most body parts are described in terms of their relationship to fruit. And in terms of the prostate, it doesn't fail to amuse me that something the size of a walnut can cause so much trouble to patients and so much mischief in the minds of the medical profession. Historically, there's been a bit of a standoff between the College of General Practitioners, who have not wanted to see patients over-screened and harmed by unnecessary investigations and treatment, and the College of Urologists, who see the worst of what prostate cancer can do to their patients, manage metastatic prostate disease, and see patients when their window for reasonable intervention has passed. And so the tension there has gone on and on for some time, leaving the GPs in the middle with the unenviable task of deciding what to do in daily practice. 
Up until quite recently, if you're a GP in the audience, you would recognise what is on the left of the screen, which is the red book, which is basically a descriptor for preventative activities in general practice. Prior to 2017, the college discouraged the use of prostate cancer screening due to concerns that that activity would cause more harm than good in patients. And that was the way uh, the Red Book described prostate cancer screening, which was not to be proactive in offering screening in, um, a, as a, an activity in general practice. Thankfully now we do have a step in the right direction in terms of prostate cancer screening because we have the College of GPs that now um, has endorsed new guidelines um, that have been released by the Cancer Council that tell us exactly who needs to be screened, how often they should be screened and what the pros and cons of screening are. And so a lot of that confusion now uh, is a thing of the past. The reason why we're here is to encourage people to feel a bit more confident about adopting what is in the guidelines. The most important part of the new guideline, and if there's one key message that I would make about tonight's discussion on prostate cancer screening and the PSA test, is whereas in the past we may have been waiting for men in our clinics to raise the topic of prostate cancer and its management, the guidelines quite clearly say now that we should be offering the opportunity to patients to discuss benefits and harms. That's quite an active role that the GP has with their patients, to offer the opportunity to discuss whether prostate cancer screening, the PSA test, is something that that man wants to pursue for himself. And what that speaks to is not saying that all men who have this discussion should do the test or should not do the test. It is saying that irrespective of who you are and your level of health literacy and whether you are aware that prostate cancer is an issue for your health, your GP will give you the information that you need to make an informed decision for yourself. So if we put that into practical terms, this is Amar, this is quite a typical patient in anybody's practice, I would suspect. Amar is 52 years old. He's a tool maker from West Africa and he's been in Australia for seven years. Amar does have a concern about prostate cancer as he has a positive family history. But he comes into clinic to check his blood pressure and cholesterol not necessarily aware of what screening activities are available, it would be for MR's GP to begin the discussion with him about whether or not testing is appropriate for him, whether he accepts the pros and the cons and chooses to test or chooses not to. The most important concept here, I think, is that Amar, like any other patient that would come into clinic, is informed to, is, has the right to informed consent or informed refusal. So that's where the GP comes in. In order to really get someone to consent to something, they need to know what that thing is, what are its benefits, what are its downsides, and present that information in plain language so the person can consider for themselves whether or not they're interested in undertaking that activity. What you see on the screen there are a collection of facts about prostate cancer and its screening and its treatment, all of which I think belong in a discussion with patients prior to screening. Um, and I think it, it would be very difficult to suggest that a patient had consented to doing this activity unless they had some idea about the benefits and the limitations of the test. But I also think that a lot of the messages there are not expected by some of our patients, even by some of us. In particular, you know, a lot of evidence now that patients who do get uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer are not automatically treated. In fact, 
in Victoria we have very good rates of active surveillance and urologists report that men feel quite comfortable with their active surveillance uh, once they have their disease um, adequately explained to them. We also know that biopsy, which has been the dreaded part of this process for years, has completely changed. I'll leave a, dis a description and discussion about prostate biopsy um, to um, our urologist who does them. But certainly the risks that we were most fearful about previously um, are not as prevalent now that urologists are offering patients transperineal biopsy instead of transrectal biopsy. So the risk of sepsis and the risk of um, serious complications are minimal with transperineal biopsy. And so I think that's something that we need to be telling our patients as they're making their decisions. Whatever your approach, in many ways, I would suggest that you become familiar with some of the facts and practice having a bit of a spiel to give to your patients. So it's not something that you feel you're needing to look up all the time, but certainly also you can have an aid to your, dis your, your discussion there that you can give the patient to take away. In my experience, having this discussion with a patient takes sort of fewer than 30 seconds. I don't think it's an onerous task. So the next question is we've given somebody the facts and we know how to get informed consent. But the burning question on everybody's mind is, well, who gets this? Who gets the test? I think one of the things that really bother um, GPs about the concept of prostate cancer screening is the idea that screening is a, a test that we're offering to the whole population, a population screening test, which sounds inappropriate. And of course, that would be inappropriate. We don't want prostate um, testing to be done on all men, irrespective of their history and their age and their preferences. The screening that gets described in the guidelines is targeted screening to specific um, populations. So it is not a population-based screening test where everybody is encouraged to check their prostate. And I think that's probably key message number two. You're only offering prostate screening to patients who fall into quite a well-described demographic. And this is what the demographic looks like. So it's two yearly PSAs, that's the activity. I think we all know that now. And if you're dealing with a man who has no symptoms, it is true, you don't need to do a DRE anymore. Although it's still a lawful examination, you can do it if you want to and the patient agrees to. By all means, you can do a DRE. There is nothing wrong with that test. But in an asymptomatic man, it is not necessary part of um, doing the screening. And it looks like this. So you're not going to screen anyone really before the age of 40 and, and you most certainly don't do PSAs as a baseline test. But what you're going to do is offer this discussion to men who are at average risk of prostate cancer, people who are worried about prostate cancer and have a family history of prostate cancer. And you'd be doing that activity within a certain age bracket where we know that the benefits of detecting prostate cancer exist. So one thing to bear in mind is don't, don't order a prostate specific antigen in a person who has a limited life expectancy. And if you are screening somebody over the age of 70, you'd probably want to think very carefully about their general health and their comorbidities and their life expectancy before you do that. Because the time to develop um, serious symptoms or mortality from the diagnosis of um, prostate cancer is six to seven years. So in other words, the more judicious we are, the more we understand the guidelines, the more we apply it to the target population, the better this will function and we will see that the right people are getting the right test at the right time and indiscriminate testing becomes a thing of the past. So if you do go ahead and you um, order a PSA, I guess the, the obvious next thing is what I'm going to do with the results. 
And sometimes that causes confusion. And I think that the new guidelines are doing a lot to try and reduce that confusion and just present a few simple concepts to we who are interpreting that test at the same time as interpreting six or seven or 10 other tests all in one go. The idea is if the PSA is less than three, you can rest assured that you can retest again in two years. If the PSA is over 10, you need a urologist. And I would have no, I, I wouldn't be able to see any reason why you would hold off getting a urological opinion on a PSA that was 10 or more. If you're screening a person at increased risk, you have to take that risk into account. So the PSA between two and three is more meaningful if person's got a high risk of cancer than in a person who is at average risk. So that's why doing your pretest counselling actually becomes important and it shouldn't just be added on to tests indiscriminately because you want to have some sense of that person so that can help you deal with the result that you get back. The one thing I do admit that is missing from the guideline is if you have chosen with your patient to screen a young person, being somebody under the age of 50, and you get a borderline test, there's no real clear idea what to do. And that's most likely because the evidence isn't clear. What do you do with those men? So in the PSA between three and 10, or you've got a younger person with a PSA that's a, approaching three, any of those scenarios where you're just not sure how to interpret what you've got or how risky the situation is, I would suggest that you call a urologist. They do call you back. We have exhibit A over here, Homie, who would call you back and help you. Um, and if it's the difference between making that phone call and knowing what to do or just saying to the patient, look, let's do it again in two years and missing your window of opportunity, I would really encourage you to just ask someone for help. I say this a lot um, when, when I'm teaching my registrars that guidelines are guidelines. And so they do guide our behaviour. But if you have a clinical situation that causes you concern, there is no harm at all in asking one of your specialist colleagues to help you in managing that situation. I, I would certainly err on that side rather than just put that person into a recall system and miss following them up appropriately. The repeat test thresholds, the guidelines are telling us if you've got the PSA between three and 10, you need to be repeating the PSA and, and that is true. Um, I, I would suggest that you need to have good recall systems in place because if you're going to retest, you want to make sure that the patient does attend for that test because a rising PSA is an abnormal test that needs follow up. Simple. Unfortunately, with some of this stuff, some of the um, guidelines that we have, um, there's a few too many facts to remember. I read a really good article the other day about guideline burnout and guideline fatigue, and I think we all get that, and there's certainly no reason or need for us to memorise all of the guidelines, and it's not possible anyway. Um, there's no need to memorise everything that I have just said. I, I've written this talk, and I've given this talk several times. I still don't know off by heart the content of my own slides, and I still look up the guidelines, particularly where you've got patients who are sitting in the shade of grey, and I think that that's entirely appropriate. So you don't have to remember everything. You just need to know where to get the information that you need to make the next decision to get your patient to the right place, which is kind of the perfect definition of general practice anyway. So I would like to suggest that you use Health Pathways. Um, as you know, I am a clinical editor for the Health Pathways program, and I have spent some time with some really enthusiastic urologists looking at those guidelines and presenting them in a way that's as user friendly as possible, that just presents those facts within a matter of a few clicks so 
that you know exactly what you're doing with each patient and with each result. So I would certainly encourage you to have a look at Health Pathways Melbourne and look at our prostate pathways, play with that and see if it's helpful to you in your practices. Anyway, so we get back to Amar and unfortunately Amar, who did want to be screened, he did have uh, a PSA of 4.3 and we did repeat it and it was 4.5. And no, he doesn't ride to Mornington every Saturday on his bike and he didn't have, um, you know, a UTI or prostatitis. And it is true, if you have UTI or prostatitis, you need to sort that out first before you're doing your PSA testing or you're going to create a horrible mess. But his, he has a bona fide abnormal result. So we will now need to make a decision about what we're going to do with MR. Just before I go on though, and just a word about following up, and I know most people are across these concepts, is that there is, it's worth stopping and thinking about it, that medico legally speaking, there's a really big difference between a recall and a reminder. Um, so a reminder is, you know, in general practice, in any practice really is, we as a medical profession being helpful, reminding patients that an activity needs to be done. But if that activity isn't done, there will be no adverse outcome really to that person's health. For example, you turned 50, it would be useful for you to check your cholesterol. But if you don't come and check your cholesterol, there will be no direct adverse effect to you. So I'm sending you a reminder. If you don't come in for your cholesterol test, I'm not medico-legally bound to chase you up. A recall is a completely different concept and a recall implies that there's an abnormal result and the patient needs to come back to deal with that. And so you need to discharge your duty of care with regards recalls. Um, and if a patient doesn't want to follow up that test, they need to be able to demonstrate to you informed refusal to do so before your duty is discharged. Anyway. Amar says, no, I, I want to deal with this test because he was worried in the first place. That's why he did it. So we're going to refer to urology. And this is where I think um, general practice can shine and make a big difference and make a massive difference to patient experience and to the patient flow and where the interaction between our specialist colleagues, in this case, urology and their army of allied health and us can be, um, it can work as well as possible. Because providing the urologist with great information is gonna make all the difference to this patient's journey. So, who needs one? I think we know that now. I think anyone who's over, a PSA over 10, PSA of two to three if you're high risk, your repeat test went over the threshold, if you've got an abnormal DRE, or you've got a young guy and you're starting to feel a little bit unsure about this rising sort of close to three PSA. All of those things completely reasonable, necessary to get a urologist involved. Homie is not shaking his head. No, good. He's happy, he's happy. We're going to keep Homie very happy because we're going to give him really good information. The pre-referral information needs to be all the PSA results that you have at your disposal, not just the one. We want to see the rise, if you can. Kidney function is important and MSU is very helpful. And if they have LUTs, you can get things started with an ultrasound. I would argue that if they have LUTs, they've got symptoms, you should be doing a DRE. That would mean we are not doing asymptomatic testing, but that's an existential question I'll leave for another night. If they have LUTs, do, do the ultrasound if you want to be especially helpful. I guess one of the things that I would suggest that general practice doesn't do is order an MRI. You need to really know what you're doing when you're looking at prostates with an MRI apparently, and I think they need to be done in centres that do them all the time. And, and I feel that that is a, 
a second line or third line test that really gets chosen by a urologist. So I, I think we can safely leave that one alone. So Amar's essential information involves all of that. His dad's prostate cancer is important. And we know that Amar is fit and healthy and is probably going to live for more than seven years. So it's appropriate to refer him on. And his referral would be nothing more complicated than what I have on the screen. And I think that would get him to the right place, the right time and seen quite quickly. So given that I have now made my referral to the urologist, it would be worthwhile us hearing what is going to happen to a patient who resembles Amar 